Now he's wanted as the next boss at Birmingham City. He started his career as a Busby babe, but failed to fulfill his potential as a player. As a manager, he learned his trade in non-league circles, always newsworthy, never more so than in his relationship with the former Barnet chairman, Stan Flashman. Barry is also known in the game for his love of his large family. He is a flamboyant character, an engaging man who's already had an eventful career. And clearly, the Barry Fry story isn't finished yet. Barry, we've travelled here this morning, Tuesday morning, not knowing whether we're talking to the present manager of Southend United or the future manager of Birmingham City or both. What, what can you tell us? Um, well, all I can tell you is that I am definitely manager of Southend United. This afternoon, after this interview, I'll be going on to Cambridge United to watch my reserves play. And this evening, I'll be travelling to Abridge Swifts and see my first team perform in the Essex Senior Cup. And my youth team done marvellous last night at Port Vale, winning 3-1. So, at the moment, I'm very proud of what's been built at South End. But, like you rightly say, Birmingham City have made a, an approach to my club to talk to me. And as of yet, my club has turned that request down. Um, you know, basically, uh, without being funny, I want to talk to Birmingham City. Um, because I feel that the club is a sleeping giant and I feel that um, if they've got ambition at Birmingham, which I'm sure they have from an outsider, they've already, uh, when Mr Sullivan and Cam Brady come in last year, uh, Terry was struggling at the bottom and they gave him a lot of money to get out of trouble, which he has done, and he spent quite a considerable amount of money. and. Um, I do feel that money will be uh, spent on the ground as well. And if that's the case, then they're very ambitious. And obviously, I would like a bigger stage um, to, to see how my players perform. But if South End United say you can't speak to them, what's going to happen? Are you going to be an unhappy manager at Roots Hall? <sighs> no, I'm not a sulker. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is I do want the opportunity to speak to Birmingham. Now, if for some reason or other I can't speak to Birmingham, then that's the end of the matter. I'll just get on with it at South End. I'll still give South End United a million percent commitment because that's the only way I can be, no matter where I am, no matter what club I am. Um, we have disagreements, but at the end of the day, I moan like hell at my players. But uh, a minute after I've called them all the names under the sun, if I'm in the bar, I'll say, what do you want to drink, Martin? You know, it's soon forgotten, and this will soon be forgotten as well. But... Um, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. At this moment, what do you think the chances are that you could become the next manager of Birmingham City? I think there's a possibility. Um, uh, I, was, I was with my chairman till sort of 10 o'clock on Sunday and I was with him again um, uh, till 7 o'clock basically on Monday evening. Um, just putting my point of view over really. And, um, you know, one thing's for sure, I have got a contract. And I have talked to Ald Wilkinson and um, everybody else connected with the Managers uh, Association, League Managers Association, and I will do nothing to break that contract. Um, but there's certain clauses in it that, um, you know, I'll abide by either way. It's as simple as that, really. Um, I think the League Managers Association has come a long way and it's not only about managers that's in work, it's about managers that, you know, are out of work and wait a long time for their money and things like that. And I think we've all got to stick together on this and do things properly. Um, and they've made tremendous strides over the short time they've been in existence. And I certainly wouldn't want to be one that um, put a spoke in that wheel. So before I would do anything, I would certainly get the OK from the League Managers Association. Absolutely, I would agree entirely with all, all, all those things. In South End, I will be always grateful. And they did give me a job, um, you know, after a difficult period at Barnet. And I did say to Vic Jobson uh, time and time again that um, uh, if he had the relationship with David Webb that I thought he had, then I'd walk to a place like South End. And eventually I did walk to South End. And I was very pleased for the opportunity. I knew when I went in there that it was the lowest gates in the first division. I knew it was most probably one of the lowest wages in the first division. 
for myself and for my uh, players. But nevertheless, I, I don't moan about that. I just get on with it. Um, you know, we sold Stan Collymore during the summer. I mean, there's no way I work to sell Stan Collymore. I think he's the best player in the country. Really? And Yes, I do. And, um, you know, there's no way I was willing to rob every bank in the high street to keep him. But, you know, the peanuts he was on and what he could get elsewhere was, uh, you know, I couldn't stand in his way. He had another two years of his contract to run. But then again, the situation at Southend United is, Southend will always have to sell their players. It's as simple as that. They need to sell to exist. You know, Southend have made numerous requests to the council to get new um, ground development and a brand new all-seater stadium, and it's been rejected, rejected, rejected. Um, like I say, the average gate is very poor. Um, so where's the money coming on for finance, a, a, a team in the first division pushing for the premiership? Um, so I accept all that and I accept that when I speak to Premier League players in the summer that I was trying to get them to Roots All, I mean obviously I didn't stand a chance. I would have had to give them three, four times the amount of what my players are on now and just no way would the chairman change his structure at the club. So you're always going to be limited at a place like Southend. I have built a very, very exciting team of young talent at South End, and it would take a lot for me to leave that behind. However, I do know that sooner or later, that talent will have to be sold to keep South End in existence. It's the name of the game. And you go anywhere, and no manager wants to sell his best players. And if you're doing that all the time, I think there's players out there, but obviously, you know, it's South End. People say, well, why do you go in the third division? Why do you go in non-league? Why do you get second division players? That's all I can afford. You know, those are facts of life. That's all that I can afford to attract lower players that's hungry for success to bring them up. You know, to be quite honest, I think uh, Mr Jobson and a lot of people at South End are very, very surprised that the uh, quality that we're playing, because I remember last, during the summer he says... Uh, you know, you're getting all third and fourth division players and non-league players. We're in the first division now. You're, or you're in the first division now. And I said, don't make no difference, Mr Chairman. The players I get are quality and we'll handle it with ease. And please God, they will do that and continue to do so that, till the end of the season. On the other hand, you're talking about Birmingham City, who, you know, quite rightly, they're fifth or sixth from bottom in the league. But their average gate is must be thirteen or fourteen thousand. They played Villa in the Coca Cola Cup. They must have got twenty five thousand people there. You know, it don't need a genius to work out if they're signing people like Danny Wallace and a couple of players from Leeds, Carl Shutt and uh, Chrissy White. Um, you know, they're not paying him what I'm paying my players at South End. So all I'm saying, why I want to talk to Birmingham if they had the same ambition as me then I would think about it very carefully about going because it would give me a greater opportunity um, to talk to better players, to pick my wits against the best and get a better team. And I would think that they would have ambition and they would want to keep their best players and improve on the situation rather than the opposite. It says then you've got to sell your players. It's the name of the game. So therefore I feel the potential of Birmingham is, is enormous, whereas it's South End, it's very, very limited. Well, what on earth will happen in Birmingham if uh, you and Ron Atkinson have to compete for the publicity stakes? Well, somebody told me, he's put a quote in the paper at the weekend that was quite funny. He said, the city isn't big enough for both of us, so we'll have to resign. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I thought that was fa fabulous. But Ron and I go back a long, long time. Um, he was manager of Kettering at the time in the non-league, and I was manager of Dunstable, which was... Um, my first managerial chance and that's really starting at the bottom because my first two games at Dunstable attracted 34 people and 47 people. If you go to Dunstable today the same people are there. Well let's look back at your playing days and how did the boy from Bedford, although a schoolboy international, end up at Manchester United? Well there was a lot of clubs after me obviously and um, Manchester United was one of them, and uh, I'd scored five goals in six games playing for England schoolboys. I went up to Manchester for a week with my mum and dad, and Nobby Stiles uh, and Johnny Giles looked after me ever so well, and I was impressed with them and impressed with the whole thing, and there was really only one club I wanted to go, and that was that. And uh, I spent four fantastic years there, 
Um, unlike my managerial career where I started really at rock bottom, my professional career I started right at the top and fell flat on my face. <laughs> Why did you fall flat on your face? Um, I've got to be honest, I think in the end for two years I was the leading goal scorer at the club, you know, at youth and everything level and then I signed a professional for the club for a couple of years and um, I was totally dedicated at first and then when I became a pro we trained in the morning and I jumped in the car to go to ADOC races and York races and Manchester races and Chester races. And then uh, when I come back, I went to the White City dog track or Bellevue dog track or somewhere else. And then I come out of there and went to the casino and have a go. And the, I, I got sidetracked with gambling, there's no doubt about that. And I was more interested in what was running at the 2.30 at ADOC than I was at, um, you know, uh, who was playing this Saturday. I mean, I didn't realise it at the time. You don't, you just get carried away with the boys, but it became an obsession and uh, I think really that's why I was a has-been that never was as a, as a footballer. And that's why I get so annoyed now when I see players with great talent abusing that talent by drinking too much or, you know, gambling too much or whatever. And I do try and put their head together and sort of put them on the straight and narrow. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean. You know, everything's great in moderation. <laughs> Talented, obviously, but uh, definitely misguided from what you say. At what point Absolutely. did it uh, happen to you in your life where you thought, well, I want to make amends in management? I don't know. I spent four years at Man United. I went to Bolton. I well scored my only league goal at Cardiff against the great John Charles. Bolton dropped Francis Lee for me. Can you believe that? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> he went up in the world and I went down. I went to Luton from there, but um, then I went out of football. I went first taste of non-league, Gravesend and Northfleet. And I loved it, but I was fortunate enough to get back um, into the league with a team called Leighton Orient. And it was there that I had my first taste of um, coaching. Or, and it was there that I first had the inclination of wanting to be a manager or a coach. But Dick Graham was a manager and we had a sponge man that didn't turn up one day and as I was out of the team, he asked for volunteers and of course I'm always enthusiastic about anything so I said, oh, I'll run on with a sponge. So we won that game and I kept that job for six games till we got beat. But then a couple of times he didn't come in early and he rang me up and says, take the training. But when you got Cliff Holton and Brian Whitehouse and as just small fry taking the training. It was quite, um, I don't know, not frightening, but it was a good experience. And it was then that I thought I could handle that in later years. And uh, although I still continued to play when I left Leighton Orient and went into the non-league scene at Romford and Bedford and St Albans and Stevenage and everywhere else, um, I eventually got player manager's job at Dunstable 20 years ago now. In your second spell at Barnet, there were amazing highs and lows under the influence of Stan Flashman. What's your considered view of those times now? Well, there were some great times with Stan. No question about that when I, when I went there. I mean, he treated me and my players as good as George Graham or Terry Vellenbulls treated the Tottenham, the Arsenals, and we had the best coaches, we had the best hotels, we had the best bonuses. Um, you know, he was a character. There's no doubt about it. Um, there was never a dull moment there. And like I say, for two or three years, uh, four years, five years, it, it was a fantastic experience. He was a De Jekyll and Hyde geezer. I mean, um, there's no doubt about that. And uh, he was evil can evil sometimes. But he was the most generous man in the world at other times. Um, where it all wrong there, God only knows. We eventually got promotion. I went long before that because basically the, the, the man was uh, taking the mickey out of me um, and enough's enough. But in saying that, I mean, he obviously had problems and, and I wish he'd uh, he'd uh, come clean with the problems because because for what he's done in the club before and because he saved the club, um, I'm sure we would, the players and I would have had a, a much more sympathetic view and would have helped him and not hindered him. And, um, you know, nobody knows the real truth of it. We sold players for two million and we don't know where the money went, you know, and the accounts one minute show a vast profit uh, of £166,000. We paid corporation tax of 50-odd thousand. And then two years later, 
you know, we're nearly two million in the red and it just doesn't make sense, you know, on a wage bill of eight or ten thousand a week with the income, the extra income we had from the, the Football League monies and the gate money, which was very good. I mean, we got the gates up from three hundred to three and a half thousand. But, you know, it's, it's a very sad time and it was a very sad time and that we would fight and it would end up as it, as it did end up because it shouldn't have. And I feel sorry for the supporters and the players at Barnet that through no fault of their own, they've had a lovely club, they've got a tremendous playing squad. Um, but if you don't pay your assets, then you take the consequences. Do you have a dream about your managerial future? After all, you started as a player with Manchester United. Would you like to manage Manchester United? Oh, yeah, no doubt about that. But, I mean, it will never happen. Um, you know, uh, but I would like to be with the big boys. I would like to pick my wits against Ron Atkinson and Alex Ferguson and George Graham and Ozzy and everybody else. Whether it's with Southend, Birmingham or wherever, I would just like to get there. I mean, obviously, if nobody from the premiership's going to offer me their manager's job, then I've got to get a team like Southend or Birmingham into the premiership and do it that way. Um, that's the only way I can achieve it. Within football circles, you're known as a very hard-working manager. You're also known as a very hard-working family man as well. Tell us about your family. I've got six children. I've got um, um, Jane, who's married, and got two granddaughters. I have uh, Mark, my son, who's a Manchester United fanatic. And, um, you know, that was from a previous marriage. Um, and now... I've got four young children, Adam eight, Amber six, Frank five, and uh, Anna Marie two. And football is a very lonely life. And, um, you know, you can't make everybody happy all the time, especially when you've got a bad result. The players don't like you, particularly the players that's not in the side. Their wives don't like you, the fans don't like you, the directors don't talk to you and you tend to be feeling really down. And I'm lucky because when I come home, I've got four screaming kids jumping all over me, so I ain't got time to feel down. It's great. I, I, I love coming at home and, and, and relaxing, um, if you call that relaxing. <laughs> but um, I love every minute of it. I love my kids, and, um, you know, it's, it's super. I'm a very, very lucky fella because um, everything I do, I enjoy. I'm lucky. I get up in the morning and I'm going to work, and I want to go to work and I love what I'm doing. There's millions of people up and down the country go to work because they have to go to work. They hate it, but they've got to go to work to work for their family, and, and uh, I'm lucky in that respect. But <clears throat> I also appreciate those people, and that's why I think, as a manager, um, I'm obligated to when they come out, they spend big money nowadays to go to football. They want to be entertained, and I'm very aware of that, and that is why all my teams from non-league to the Football League from the third to the first. I want them to entertain. I want them to go and score more goals than the opposition. I ain't bothered if the opposition get five, as long as we get six or seven. I want those fans up and down the country to go home and say, I enjoyed watching whatever club Barry Fry's manager of. Finally, although David Sullivan's not been allowed to speak to you, he has been speaking to the media, and he said that you're very much top of his list to be the new manager of Birmingham. Why do you think he's gone for Barry Fry? Well, I think if he's a shrewd businessman, the only time I've seen David Sullivan was when I went to Royal Ascot and I went to the winner's enclosure and I don't back many winners and I back Risky. And he owns Risky. So that's the only connection I've got with David Sullivan, but it's a good one. I think this fella's a winner. Um, I'd like to be a winner. And I think t together, who knows? But why... I am top of his list, I would say. He looked at what I've done at Barnet on, in difficult circumstances. He's looked at what I've done at Southend in very difficult cir circumstances because when I went to Southend last year, along with Birmingham, we was, uh, they was in, uh, in trouble, relegation trouble. Southend was second bottom when I went there. They had nine games left. Their previous nine games had only won one. We were six points adrift to the third club, and the third club had a game in end. So it really was, you know, curtains. And um, but I didn't agree with that, and I said to the chairman at the time, nine games, 27 points, we should finish halfway up. 
We didn't quite do that, but we won five out of the nine. We drew one and lost three, and we done very, very well on a team that uh, basically the deadline had gone, so I couldn't fetch any other players in. So he seen me change the whole team round in the summer, sell my best player, you know, and um, start off again with players from the lower regions, and we've done very well. I think we've been the surprise packet of the first division, and that gives me great satisfaction. And the main thing that gives me more satisfaction is we're still scoring the goals. Along with Crystal Palace, we are the first division leading goal scorers. So no matter where I am, Dunstable, Bedford, Barnet, where each all of those clubs have scored over 100 goals in a season, I'd love to do that at Southend, or I'd love to do it at Birmingham, or whatever. But I'm ambitious, I'm 48, fat and happy, time's running out, and I'd like to manage a big, big club. They don't come any bigger, in my opinion, than Birmingham. I hope you get your ambition. Barry. Thank you very much. And thank you for your time on a very big and busy day for you today. Pleasure. The Boss was proudly sponsored by Ford.